if we are responsible and we're going to be responsible with the safety and health of our parishioners and our community, we have to do our part in limiting the spread and the containment of this uh, particular virus. Pastor Solomon Kinlock Jr. of Triumph Church. These are very tough times for everybody. Um, and it, 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 for me, is, is really telling that Easter, the most important holiday in the Christian church, takes place at the height of such a trying time. I, I wonder what you make of that, uh, that aligning of things, that we are at this really critical and tragic juncture in the story of humanity. At the time, the very time that we celebrate the, the rising of Christ, uh, the, the, the most important event in Christian history. Well, you just hit it on the head. Uh, that is the relevancy of the resurrection uh, that uh, our founder or the founder of our faith uh, was confronted with an impossible situation. Uh, he was crucified uh, and we believe he was dead on Saturday, uh, but although he was in a tomb, uh, he resurrected on Sunday morning, reminding us that if it was not impossible for him to extricate himself out of a situation, that we are available and we have accessibility to that power right now. Yeah. Uh, so, so give me a sense of the things that uh, you, your church members are coming to you with and the things that you're telling them about the difficulty of now, about the losses that we're all sustaining. Um, what, are you, what are you counseling people to feel and to do? Well, one of the greatest challenges that we face is that we're such a relational church and this robs us of our ability for physical, authentic relationships. Uh, and so uh, many of our members, including myself as leader, miss that, the ability to just uh, share comfort and consolation through a hug, through warm greetings in close contact and proximity with one another. But one of the things that I have sought as a pastor to redirect the focus and the attention is not necessarily on us meeting together physically as a church. Mm -hmm. uh, although uh, some would make that uh, the pivotal point of this particular discussion, instead of uh, discussing and debating whether we should meet together as a church, uh, because if we are responsible and we're going to be responsible with the safety and health of our parishioners and our community, we have to do our part in limiting the spread and the containment of this uh, particular virus. And so what this does for the body of Christ is give us an opportunity to more so not just have church, but be the church mm -hmm. and start doing church. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is launch uh, a 60 day of generosity where it gives us an opportunity to uh, make a greater impact and show the hand and the feet of Christ in the earth now more than ever. So on a daily basis, we're feeding 200 people a day. Uh, we're delivering groceries to seniors, single uh, parents, those with physical inequities, uh, disabilities, handicaps. Uh, we are helping those that are unemployed, that have been laid off through the midst of this crisis. We have a digital divide uh, in the DPS in many of our urban community centers. And so what we're doing is ensuring uh, that uh, we have an opportunity at this particular point uh, to distribute laptops on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, so we're doing more service now uh, yeah. uh, to redirect our focus and our attention. You know, uh, people have talked about this distancing that we're, that we're experiencing and they sometimes describe it as social distancing, but uh -huh. it reminded me this week that that's kind of a, a misnomer. It's physical distancing. Exactly. It's not social distancing. And as you're saying, it's not spiritual. Exactly. Exactly. Well, yeah, well, we have a drive in. So one of the things we wanted to do is say, how do we continue uh, to articulate and communicate the gospel, the good news in a manner uh, that people can know that, listen, although we may feel helpless in a lot of, of situations, we're still not hopeless. The founder of our faith gave us hope uh, during this particular time of the celebration that uh, although the carpenter life death comes uh, to reshape the, the view of the 
a window in which we look out on life, we got to hang on to the reality uh, that there's a brighter day ahead. And that's what the church is responsible, not to just communicate that and remind people of that, but also to show people that. This is an opportunity for us to come together now more than ever to be there for the least, the left out and the left behind in a way. We were already doing that. We were already feeding thousands of people a week, but this gives an opportunity to take the focus off ourselves so we can give a greater blessing to somebody else. Yeah, uh, and we talk about the financial strain as well that this is causing so many people in so many institutions, but churches I feel like especially uh, get hit hard when the economy freezes the way it the way it has. Uh, how are you? How are you able to to sort of maintain through? Well, one of the things that we've uh, been a proponent of is stewardship. Uh, that no that no matter uh, how many days of plenty you have uh, in the life of Joseph, one of the great biblical characters of Scripture, always prepare for a day of famine. That's not just a principle we teach congregants. It's also a principle uh, we abide by as a church. This church is a hundred years of age. Uh, we are celebrating that this year. Mm -hmm. And so this church is not new to difficult times. Uh, we're not new uh, as a church to times of scarcity and of lack. Uh, but what we do is we always hope for the best, but we prepare for the worst. Yeah. And right now we are living on faith. Yes, we've been tremendously hit like most congregations have, uh, but right now, uh, we're trying to be a model uh, to so many that this cannot just be about economics. Uh, this has to be about people. This has to be about us coming together. And we may not have as much resources as we had previous to the crisis, but what we do is take the resources that we do have or that we do get and be there for people so they don't feel like they're by themselves. Yeah, yeah. So walk me through uh, uh, the religious services that, uh, that would normally happen at this time of the year. Last Sunday was Palm Sunday. Uh, Friday is Good Friday and Sunday is Easter. What do those look like in your church right now? For us, we have a 6 a.m. prayer call. Uh, we asked 5,000 people to jump on that call at 6 a.m. on Thursday morning. That's Monday, Thursday. Uh, that's the day, as you know, uh, being as biblically astute as you are, uh, that Jesus sat down with his disciples and he was betrayed. Uh, we also have a 6.30 service that night uh, to observe that setting in which Jesus was in. Uh, we have a Friday noon service. Uh, it's not just going to be streamed. All of those services are not just going to be streamed on Facebook, uh, but they are also... Uh, providing drive up services where you can get in your car, respecting, as you said, physical distancing uh, and uh, respecting uh, what we can do as individuals to limit our contact and to limit the spread of this disease. And so we're doing that Friday at noon. Then we have a five o'clock service on Saturday. We have three services on Sunday. Our 1045 service for the first time is going to be broadcast live on the Detroit Praise Network. Uh, all of those services are drive-in service. So if people want to get in their car, pull up, they don't have to get out of their car. They don't have to roll down a window. They can turn their radio on. They can be, listen to the service live and watch the view from a giant screen uh, in the church parking lot. Uh, on top of that, uh, if they didn't make it to church that day, they can also that night see the rebroadcast because we're taping the service and that will be replayed on uh, the Word Network. Mm -hmm. at nine, uh, at 8.30 uh, p.m. that evening. And so we're trying to make sure that we have a multiplicity of ways for people to be able to access uh, the gospel and get the communication they need to make it through this tremendous crisis. Yeah, yeah. And, and give me a sense of how you as a pastor, I mean, I think uh, this is a time when people turn more to faith uh, and turn more to vehicles of faith uh, than they do normally. Uh, how's this been for you, uh, and how are you managing all of all of what's changing around this? Well, well, you know this is a Herculean responsibility uh, right now for all of us that are serving on the front line. I pray daily for our first responders. I'm praying for all our humanitarian and philanthropic uh, leaders who are trying to make sure that people people were already in a crisis before this. So many people, 
and now it has been aspirated and exasperated, uh, and not to mention the, the mental uh, uh, drain uh, that it's having and the mental demand it's having on so many uh, that are wrestling with anxieties and worries. And so as a leader, one of the things that we have to do is remind ourselves that the Bible portrays those of us that are of faith as soldiers. And when a soldier goes to the battlefield, he knows that he goes to the battlefield under the threat of death. And there's a possibility that he may not return home. But the reason he chooses to go anyway is because he knows when a battle is going on, somebody has got to fight. And as believers, we can't go and hide out somewhere in a house at the end of the day. We want to stay safe and stay home as much as we can, but we can't do that to the extent that you have the marginalized and those that are in the crevice of life not having the resources they need to make it through this as well. And so the message that we preach on Easter is yes, uh, the external factors are conducive to a feeling of fear, but those of us of faith uh, have decided that we would rather uh, die on our feet than to live life on our knees. Yeah. Wow, powerful words, powerful words. Uh, Thank you. Pastor Solomon Kinlock Jr. of Triumph Church. Uh, it was really great to have you here and really great the, the work that you're doing just to, to keep people's hope and faith stoked at this time, right? Uh, Thank you, Brother Henderson. You've been such a tremendous voice in our community. Uh, I have much love and respect. Uh, for what you have done and what you continue to do and what you stand to do in the future. And so thank you for the honor of just sharing with you today. Oh, thank you. It's great to see you, even under these strange circumstances. We'll have to get you in the studio soon. I'm so looking forward to it. Normal. Okay. We've got, we got to get together on the other side of this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter.